Good evening. How's everyone doing this evening? Great. Hope you're doing well. I do want to say a special uh, hi from all the folks out in uh, San Juan Capistrano, the ministry out there, and any of those that might be listening. And my wife is supposed to be listening, so I get to say hi to my wife, okay? So, and, you know, Richard is 100% correct. I definitely married up. That's for sure. And I can, with all, oops, that's a little loud, isn't it? With, with all genuine sincerity, I, I uh, the most important thing ever happened in my life was when I got saved. The second most important thing ever happened in my life really is when I met my wife, Lori. We, obviously, at the time, we were dating because she was the one who was instrumental in leading me to the Lord Jesus Christ and to the Word of God rightly divided. So I definitely married up. <laughs> and I'm so grateful for that. Real excited about what we're going to look at tonight. However, I do realize that um, I'm from Anaheim and I'm in Blackhawks territory. Now, some of you know what's going on, what I'm talking about. You were last year. Exactly right. Yeah, it didn't work out in our situation last night. But for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, we're, of course, talking about uh, the greatest game on earth, hockey. You know, hockey is something that we're going to play in heaven because it talks about the face of the deep is frozen. <laughs> so you guys can start learning about that. But both the Anaheim Ducks... And the Chicago Blackhawks, although, although they are not playing each other right now, both actually are fighting for their playoff lives right now. Both games are on right now. <laughs> so if you see me every once in a while, yeah, if you see me, every, you're just kind of going like that. <laughs> you kind of know what I'm doing, right? But when I see you doing the same thing, I'll know what you're doing too, right? So, yeah, he's got <laughs> several of the guys, they held the phone up, right? Look at that right there, so... <laughs> That's what I understand. Yeah, that, I heard the lightning already. Uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's good. So anyway, we, uh, so like I say, when I was heading out here, I was telling my wife, you know, man, I'm, I'm kind of going into enemy territory up there. And she said, well, you'll be among friends, a grace believer. So there's, that trumps everything else, right? So that's good. Of course, nowadays, you can't really say Trump without something get, get, somebody getting offended by that, you know, but <laughs> another whole issue there, so. All right. Um, I'm going to have you open your Bibles this evening over to 2 Timothy, where we have our uh, theme verse and our our assignment. So if you look with me over to 2 Timothy, uh, chapter number 1, and then you also want to get 1 Thessalonians, chapter... uh, Look over to 1 Thessalonians, and uh, let me just find this here really quick here. Look at First Timothy chapter, Second uh, Timothy chapter number. Did I say Second Timothy one? That's what I want, right? Okay. And we can just go there. Look at Second Timothy one. Watch here at verse three. He says, "I thank God, whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy." When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel, and then notice especially that last phrase there, according to the power of God. Hold that verse there and go to Second Thessalonians 1, verse 11. Second Thessalonians 1, 11, and it says this, Wherefore also we pray always for you, that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness, and then notice this phrase, and the work of faith with power. Let's have a word of prayer. 
Our gracious God and Father, we're thankful that we can spend some time again this evening in your word. We're grateful for the messages that we've heard all weekend so far, the encouragement, the strengthening, the challenge that we've received by the various speakers and by your ability, the ability of your word to penetrate our, our thinking and then to help us to, to, to realize if and when adjustments need to be made in the, in the decisions and the direction of our lives and then to empower us to follow through, not in our own strength, not in self-confidence, but in the strength of your word, having confidence in what you are doing in this dispensation of grace. And we'll thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, the title to my message actually is the phrase in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 1, verse 11, right at the end of the verse. Let me read the whole verse there. 2 Thessalonians 1, 11, it says, Wherefore also we pray always for you, that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. And tonight we're going to be talking about power. If you'll go back over to 2 Timothy chapter number 1, 2 Timothy chapter number 1, let me state the purpose of, of this message tonight. And that way, if, if I get everything else messed up, at least I will have stated the purpose clearly. How's that, okay? What I want to do this evening is to demonstrate from Scripture that the Word of God rightly divided is the source of our spiritual power. The Word of God itself is the spiritual power. That power is only realized... It's only manifested when we believe it. And the believing occurs in the inner man. That's all, that's all I want to talk about tonight. If you've been around Grace School of the Bible or this ministry and the related Grace Ministries for years, that's a theme we, we often and really often. Word of God alone. Scripture alone, the Word of God rightly divided, is the source of spiritual power. Our confidence needs to be where the power is, not in ourselves but in the Word of God. We are labors together with God in an eternal purpose. This is big. If we're going to labor together with Him and the labor be effective and effectual to the intended outcome and purpose that God has, then we must learn on a day-by-day, moment-by-moment basis to abandon confidence in self and self-will and self-ideas and I got a better idea kind of thing and learn more and more and more what it means and how to. Just trust God's Word. That's the great battle. That's the battle right there, is to learn to have confidence that the Scripture is what it claims to be, the Word of God, and it will accomplish God's work in the heart of anyone who believes it. That's the goal tonight. That's the goal of your message. That's the, that's the goal of this whole ministry. And it's something that we all... Whoever the preacher is up here, whoever it is that's sitting in the seat out there, something that we all are learning and want to continue to have open hearts to learn. You'll recall from Ted's message last night a little bit of the background here about Timothy and his situation. Look with me again over at 2 Timothy chapter number 1, and you can see Timothy is expressing quite a concern. I'm sorry, Paul is expressing quite a concern for Timothy's at the time he writes this book, his, his present emotional state. You can see 
at verse 4, he mentions Timothy's tears. You can see at verse 5, he mentions that he's recognizing that Timothy is even doubting his own, the sincerity of his own faith. You can see he conveys his awareness of Timothy's situation in verse 6, that Timothy has really let the, the flames of the fire of the ministry, the word, kind of die down just for the coals and He's neglected the ministry. You can see in verse 7 that he, he acknowledges to Timothy that, Timothy, I, I understand that what is gripping you right now is that spirit of fear. And then he also acknowledges in verse 8 that, Timothy, I understand what you're experiencing. You're experiencing the afflictions associated with standing for the message and the messenger. And so what's happening is as you... As you're evaluating the situation, the circumstances, you've actually become a little bit ashamed. You've kind of backed off a little bit. You've come to the conclusion that, you know what? Maybe, maybe there's a different way to do this than maybe all these people that are rejecting this message. All those that have come and then over the years left Maybe they have better ideas. Maybe we shouldn't push this message so hard. You can see at verse 8, Paul is conveying to him that, that, that Paul understands that, that struggle of being ashamed of the message and the messenger. He says, he says at verse 8, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner. You look a little further in this chapter, he mentions... Verse 15, this thou knowest, I'll come back to verse 15 later in the message. Go, back, go, go down to verse 16, he says, The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus. For he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of what? Now think about that, think about that. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently. And, and what? Think about that. At a time when it was dangerous for you to be associated with Paul. He's in bonds. He's in chains. At a time that it was dangerous to have your name or your relationship connected with him. You're a part of that guy. He not only sought him out diligently and he found him. He was not ashamed of my chain, he says. He says that to Timothy because he wanted Timothy to know that even though it looked like everyone had abandoned the doctrine, there's still a few. Remember the background. Go back to 1 Timothy chapter number 1. Go back to 1 Timothy chapter number 1. Verse 3. He says, as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus... When I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge them that they teach no other doctrine, neither, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions, rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. Remember that Paul left Timothy at Ephesus for the purpose of, of holding back the apostasy, maintaining the testimony to the truth of the word of God rightly divided at Ephesus. And he did tell Timothy in this book, look at chapter number four, he told him very clearly, Timothy, hey, listen, this thing's going to get bad. He says over in chapter 4, verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared from, with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain. He says, Timothy, they're going to leave the grace message, they're going to go back to the law, and they're going to do it in the name of Jesus. He tells them that in 1 Timothy. By the time he writes 2 Timothy, the verse we read a moment ago, we actually skipped over it, but 2 Timothy 1, he has to say this at verse 15 now. 2 Timothy 1, he says, This thou knowest that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me. Where was Timothy? He was at Ephesus. Where is Ephesus? Do you understand what was happening in Timothy's thinking? He's thinking, wait, Paul, you left me here at Ephesus for the purpose of, of trying to hold back the apostasy. 
I was by your side all these years. I was your understudy. You trusted me. And I failed. Part of the emotional afflictions that Timothy himself was experiencing, it was leading to the tears that was the result of that spirit of fear was that self-condemnation because I let you down, Paul. Think about that. Think about that phrase at verse 1 Timothy 1, 6, 7, 7. He says, wherefore God hath not given us the spirit of what? If the spirit of fear doesn't come from God, if it's not a gift associated with the gift of grace, he says, for God is not given. Well, then where does the spirit of fear come from? What is it? People say, well, that was the devil. Well, okay, maybe. I don't think that's what that verse is talking about, Philip. What is the spirit of fear that so gripped him? Where did it come from? He was using the wrong standards to evaluate the circumstance that he found himself in at Ephesus. He was saying, I failed. That's why they left. That's why they all departed. I let them down. And that spirit of fear just gripped him. Those tears. Those were genuine tears. Those were not tears of physical pain. Those were emotional. That was emotional pain coming out of a broken man who had labored with Paul some 20, 25, maybe 30 years who had seen Paul in the doctrine, who had fully known Paul's manner of life, doctrine, faith, charity, patience, endurance. He'd seen all that. And then as he's looking at his own circumstance and situation, he says, man, after 30 years of laboring with Paul, have I really believed any of this? Or have I just been a big show? A big failure. See what's going on here? That's why Paul has to tell him at verse 5, he says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in you. He I know you believe this stuff. I, I, I know it's inside of you, Timothy. Just right now you're looking at the wrong thing to evaluate what's going on. As Ted mentioned last night, He's got to get Timothy's thinking off of his emotions to his thinking. He says at verse at verse uh, verse seven, he says, "For God has not given us the spirit of fear. If He didn't give us that, what did He give us?" That Paul goes on to say, "Power and of love and a sound mind." We're going to talk about power tonight. When he tells him that verse 8, look at verse 8. He says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but be thou partaker of the what? What's the word there? Jump down to verse 12. For the which cause I also suffer what? Can we appreciate what Paul just conveyed to Timothy in that statement right there? He said, Timothy, the reason I I can write about your tears is because I've cried them as well. The reason that I I can write about the spirit of fear gripping you is that that spirit of fear has gripped me. Without were fightings and within were fears. He says, Timothy, I've needed the God of comfort to comfort me 
And he did. Through his word. And Timothy, I'm seeking to comfort you with the same comfort wherewith I was comforted by God. Timothy, I also suffer these things. He tells him at verse 8, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but be thou partaker. It's almost like Timothy saying, Well, I am! Help! I'm drowning! And he's saying, Yeah, but Timothy, you're appealing to the wrong source to be your strength to get you through this. He says, But be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to what? What's it say there? According to what? The power of God. Listen, the power of God is the word of God rightly divided, period. It's the scripture. It's not our emotion. It's not our feelings. It's not how what our opinion is. It's what the Word of God says. When he says to Timothy, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel, but, but Timothy, do it according to the ability of the Word of God to sustain you. When we talk about power tonight, we're not talking about the power of of God to speak a creation into existence. We're not talking about the power of God to part the Red Sea, to cleanse the lepers, to raise the dead. We're talking about a different kind of power, but a power nonetheless. And every bit as effectual as the other. Let me have you look at a couple of verses back in the Old Testament, a few that kind of you kind of see these two different ideas of power. I'm going to have you go, if you would, if you would, to Exodus 9. Look over to Exodus chapter number 9. Usually when you talk about the power of God, people do think in terms of healings, raising the dead, parting the Red Sea. Indeed, the details about parting the Red Sea, getting Israel, pardon me, Getting Israel out of Egypt and parting the Red Sea, that is the standard of the power of God consistently through the entire Old Testament. That's the standard back then. Look at a couple of verses here, if you would. Uh, I guess I'd better get there myself. Look over to Exodus 9 here real quick. Watch this. Look at this. Look at Exodus 9. He says, at verse 16, And in very deed for this cause have I raised thee up, for to show in thee my what? My power and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. Look at chapter 15. Look over to chapter 15 real quick, if you would. Chapter 15. What is, when, when he says that I might show my power in thee, what kind of power was he talking about? He was talking about the, the external, visible, physical demonstration of God's raw ability, raw power. The plagues, the signs, the wonders, the destruction of Egypt, Pharaoh and his armies, the parting of the Red Sea. Raw physical power. Look at how it says it over here in Exodus 15 at verse, uh, let's see. Uh, I wrote down verse 16, but it doesn't look like that. Maybe it's verse 6 here. There it is, verse 6. It says, Thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in what? Power, thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemies. And it is in this context, when he's talking about the power of God, that this is where God is made known for the very first time, as he's identified in verse 3, the Lord is a man of what? War. Look with me, if you would, to Exodus 32. Look at Exodus 32. Exodus 32 and verse 11 here. Look at Exodus 32, verse 11. And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot 
against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with what? Great power and with mighty, uh, 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 mighty hand. Listen, all those references were was reference to physical demonstration of external raw power and ability of God. Everybody see that there? But now look at this verse. Go to Numbers chapter 14. Go to Numbers chapter 14 here. Look at Numbers 14, verse 17. Look at Numbers chapter 14, verse 17. He says this. This is one of the times, one of the many times with Moses is, is really pleading for the nation that God doesn't just wipe them out. That God doesn't demonstrate upon them the same power He demonstrated upon the Egyptians. He says this, And now I beseech thee, let the... What? Let the, let the power of my Lord be great. Stop there. Wait, wait, wait. Stop there. All the way up to this point when, when the statement is said, something about the power of the Lord being great, what was it? It was the destruction of the Egyptians, the plagues, the signs, the wonders, the parting of the sea. Look what it is here. And now I beseech thee that the power of my Lord be great, according as thou hast spoken, saying, The Lord is what? And of great what? Doing what? You see that? This is a different power here. The power that Moses is interceding, asking for, asking God to put on display, to demonstrate here. It's not the power to destroy the Egyptians, to part the sea, to cleanse the lepers, to raise the dead. But that God would deal with the nation of Israel at that point, though they deserve the same thing that he gave to the Egyptians, destruction because of their sin and rebellion. He's saying, Lord, I beseech thee, based upon the greatness of your power to forgive, to extend mercy. Both are demonstrations of power, are they not? But they're not the same thing. From the same God, but two different issues of power. You go back to 2 Timothy. When the Apostle Paul says to Timothy that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power. And so he tells them to be a partaker of the afflictions of, of, of the gospel according to the power of God. He doesn't mean according to God's ability to part the Red Sea, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. He means according to the ability of the word of God to do the work of God. Timothy, be a partaker. Get back in the fight. It's a good fight. Fight the good fight of faith. That's a fight worth fighting. Timothy, get back in the fight based upon the ability of God's work to sustain, to equip, to comfort, to encourage, to stabilize. Let me ask you, have you found the Word of God to be any of those things to you? You've probably found them to be all. Think back a time in your life, maybe it was today, maybe last week, maybe a couple of weeks, whatever. Think back a time in your life when you were in a situation where you were just really trying to figure some things out and you were struggling with, struggling with something. And you, Paul says, cast down, but not destroyed. And you felt that way. Perplexed, but not in despair. And all you could do is just say, Lord, to whom shall I go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Shall I go to the world to find the solution for my trouble? Shall I go to psychology? Shall I go to religion? Is the law going to help? Are traditions going to help? Is baptism going to help? Is making more promises going to help? 
Lord, I think what I should do is just look to Calvary once again. Just to go look at the cross again. And let Christ crucified answer my dilemma. You go with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. You know, when Paul came to the Corinthians, he knew a lot more than he told them. Right? He says over, in, I, I said chapter 1, but quickly, if you would, go to chapter 2 here. Chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, he says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. He knew the testimony of God. But he says, For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him, what? Him crucified. Why would he do? Of all the things that Paul knew, and, and I understand by the, by the, when he's writing this book, he does not yet know all the revelation of the mystery. Indeed, when he writes 2 Corinthians, he says, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. So he knows when he writes 2 Corinthians, he's going to still get more information. He doesn't have it all. But he also has a whole lot more than this. So why did he approach it this way? Why is it that when he says, when, when I was with you, I determined, I made a conscious decision not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why do you do it that way? Go back to chapter number one. Look at what he says. What are they arguing about? What are they fussing about? Are they fussing and arguing in verse 10 and 11? Yes, they are. All kinds of divisions and contentions. What's the dispute? It's which baptism is better than the other? I'm of, G I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ, I'm of Paul. Hey, I'm, I'm closer to God than you are. And they're all appealing to the issue of baptism. Isn't that interesting? If you ever want to get into a um, stimulating conversation <laughs> with those who profess to be Christians, and, and, you know, many of them are, I understand, but bring up baptism. They say, oh, don't do that, man, you'll start a fight. Yeah, bring it up. <laughs> Not to start a fight, but to stimulate their thinking. You, you don't... In, how many chapters in 1 Corinthians? You, you can, it's an open book test. You can, how many? 16. Listen, you, you don't get but 13 verses in a book of 16 chapters, but Paul brings up baptism. He doesn't say, no, 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 let's, let's wait till the end of the book, and I'll just kind of mention it briefly, so it's not to ruffle any feathers sir. He says, you guys are divided and some of you guys are saying you're this group and that group and this guy. It's because of baptism. He brings it up. It's because they were glorying in a weak and beggarly yet scriptural thing. Okay, just like the law. Law is scriptural. And he says at verse 7, I'm just going to jump ahead to verse 17. He says, listen, guys, but Christ sent me not to baptize. What did he just do there in relation, in, in conveying his connection with baptism? Hey, it, it isn't a part of what Christ gave him. He says, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the what? The cross of Christ should be made of none effect. To make something of none effect is to do what? It's to render it a waste, no power, no ability. Did you know that? Something as powerful as the preaching of the cross can actually be rendered of none effect when you take something that's weak and beggarly and superimpose it upon the preaching of the cross. That's what was happening here. They were saying, oh, yes, we believe that Christ died for our sins and was buried and rose again. And we got baptized in the name of Peter, Cephas, Paul, John, whatever. They, they say John in the context, right? But you see what was happening here. Rather than them seeing that Christ crucified was the wisdom and the power of God, all that human viewpoint about God things taking and focusing their attention on something scriptural, but not for this dispensation. Focusing their attention on a baptism that's not the real baptism. 
And he says at verse 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Listen, wisdom of words will render the cross of Christ of none effect. There's your two choices. The cross of Christ or wisdom of words. Pick one, because you cannot function on both at the same time. He says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish what? If to the lost people the preaching of the cross is foolishness, then why would you, as a saved person, be viewing the cross the same way lost people view it? And by looking at baptism, by looking at those religious ordinances, by, by the way, real quickly, if you hold that verse there, go back, go, go, I shouldn't say go back, but go to, go to Galatians 4 real quick. Look at this. Go to Galatians 4 real quick. Look at this passage here. He says, at Galatians 4, 9, he's, uh, of course, I mean, the whole context here, he says, guys, you, your, your heirs, your, your sons. Yeah, look at verse 7, he says, Galatians 4, 7, Wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. How be it then? When you knew not God, you did, but you, did, you, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods. If they're no gods, they got no ability and no power. But now, after they have known God, the real power, or rather are known of God. How turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements? Or into your desire again to be in bondage? If it's weak, it has no what? If it's beggarly, it has no what? It has no resource. The bank's like our bank accounts, all zeros, and no one's before it. Some of y'all got that. The rest of y'all, I guess you're asleep. <laughs> all right. If it's beggarly, it's poverty-stricken. Right? He says, he, here, here, you, here you, you know God now. Hey, and, and more than that, God knows you. you. You belong to him now. And you're turning to something that has no power and no resource. You're turning to the law. You see the parallel? In first, you can go back to 1 Corinthians. He says, guys, you, you guys are doing the same thing with baptism. All, all, these scriptural things that aren't appropriate in the dispensation of grace, you're appealing to that to accomplish God's work, and it's rendering the cross of none effect. Go back to 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18. He says this, 118. He says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved. It was the... Oh, what's the difference there? What's the difference between saying it was the power of God compared to saying it is the... What's the difference between those two? Yes, if you say it was the power of God, that suggests, but maybe it isn't any longer, so we need to find out something else that works. But if you say it is the power of God, Paul is saying the same preaching of the cross, that same message. The power is in the word of God. When you believed it, you actually got saved. Something, God's purpose actually happened. And when you believe that, things changed. That same power that took you out of Adam and placed you into Christ. That's the same power, the same message, the same resource that we need to appeal to now, he's saying. They were looking to baptism, thinking that would make them more holy, more spiritual, more godly. Say, no, guys, it's the cross. He goes on to say in this chapter here, I'm going to jump ahead to verse, uh, to verse uh, 23. He says, But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, a stumbling block unto the Greeks, foolishness, but unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ. And by the way, in the context, that's Christ crucified. Christ what? The power of God and the wisdom of God. Jump ahead, if you would, to chapter 2. 
Watch what he says here. But my, and I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in what? Demonstration of the Spirit and of what? You've got to make sure that you read that verse right in the context you often get the idea that what Paul is talking about there when he says in demonstration of the spirit of power, it, it, in this sense that Paul is going around like a magic show, saying, I'm the mighty power of Jesus. Watch this sign. Poof, and he heals someone. Watch this sign. Poof, and he raises someone to death. And he's going around. And there's a, there's a mighty power of God. That's not what that verse is talking about there. When that verse says, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, the power is the word of God to work. When they believe it. When Paul came in and preached cross, Christ cru- preached the cross, Christ crucified to the Corinthians, what actually happened to any of the Corinthians who believed it? What happened to them? They got saved! Wait a minute. In an instant of time, with an eternal impact... They were taken out of Adam, placed into Christ, given a heavenly, set with Christ in heavenly places, made complete in the Lord Jesus Christ, baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ, sealed with the Holy Spirit, a promise forgiven of all their sins, made accepted in the Beloved. Is that not power? He says... That was the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Not that I could come and, and try to copy Peter on Acts and so forth. Not that Paul, he, Paul himself says, I was not a whit behind the very cheapest apostles. But that verse is not talking about the idea of cleansing the lepers, raising the dead. He's saying, I came to you and I preached Christ crucified And the Holy Spirit demonstrated his power for his word to work. Because some of you guys believed it and you got saved. See that there? Now, why do you do it that way? Look at verse 5. Very, very important. Verse 5. That your faith, your belief, your trust, your confidence... What you're depending on, verse 5, 2, 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in what? In the context, what's the power of God? It's Christ crucified. It's the preaching of the cross. It's the word of God conveying to these individuals the value of the cross of Christ, the questions that it answered, the solutions it provided. Why? When Paul came to the Corinthians, did he start this way? He had more to tell them, as identified, as, as indicated in verse 6, 7. Does, does, doesn't he have, he says, I, I've got this hidden wisdom I, I wanted to tell you guys, but I couldn't tell you because of where you guys were at. So why did he not tell them the things he writes about in verse 6, 7, 8? Why did he keep it at the preaching of the cross? He tells you that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Can I say it this way? If you don't really grasp and appreciate and understand how the Christian life starts in the first place, you'll never understand how to live it. If we don't, if, if we don't see the value in Christ crucified, the preaching of the cross, and how the Word of God is the power that produces God's purpose. If we don't start there right, you can talk about the mystery all you want. They're not going to get it. They might get it intellectually. You can talk about baptism all you want, baptism in Romans 6. They might intellectually, intellectually acknowledge it, but they're not going to get it. And think of all the struggles there that will, will, therefore that will follow in their life as they attempt to walk as a Christian, but don't understand the resource and the power is Christ crucified. Look over to 2 Corinthians 4. Look over to 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. 
2 Corinthians chapter number 4. Paul was over there in 1 Corinthians. He just made it, He tried to make it so clear, guys, that I did what I did because that your, your faith needs to stand not in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. If we don't know where our faith is to stand, then we will not be equipped to stand in the faith. Understand that? That's something we have to keep figuring out. I'm telling you, day by day, we have to go back to the cross. Go back to the cross, right? Look at how he says it in this passage. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. He says, but we have this treasure in what? You know, the, the, the joke among the men here and the preachers is you, you can always tell who the preacher is because what, what does he do? That's on the tie, on, on the tie and the set, right? And I was kind of thinking about that verse that what we probably should do one of these times when we're getting up to preach, instead of putting on a nice suit and tie, we ought to just go, go to oh, some secondhand store. Don't go in the store. Go into the back where the dumpsters are and dig clothes out of there and wear them up here, right? To show just some old broken down trashy vessel. <laughs> That's all we are. He says here, but we have this treasure in what? In earthen vessels. What's that? What's an earthen vessel? Yeah, just easily broken. Just made of clay. No resources of itself. No strength, no energy of its own. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Why? Why, why, do, why do you do it that way? That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. What does that mean? What's that mean? What's that mean? Say it loud. What does that mean? Yeah, exactly. Think about those two verses together. God takes and puts this treasure, that which he thinks is so valuable, that which is so priceless to him, he takes and puts it surely in an unsecure place. A, a, a place where the, no one would ever think to look. And he puts it there so that those in whom he put it would learn that they are not the treasure. Christ is the treasure. His word is the treasure. And what do you do with the treasure? Do, do, do you lock it up and all safe or nobody can steal it and so forth? Or do you go and utilize the assets? Do you go and experience the, the assets? He says, we have this treasure in earth and vessels that the excellency of the power, the excellency of the ability, the ability of the word of God to exceed beyond that we will recognize that it's of God. He's the resource. Not myself. We are troubled on every side. There's our experience. Yet not in distress. There's his ability and his resource. Perplexed. That's our experience. That's the outer man. But not in despair. Because we have a resource that's eternal. Persecuted. There's the external. It's real. We feel it. It impacts us but not forsaken. How do you know we're not forsaken? Because the resource says nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We cannot be forsaken because God will not forsake His treasure. He will not forsake His own and we belong to Him now. Cast down. You know, in, in my mind when I, when I think about that, it... Look over what he says in chapter 7. We'll come back to that in just a moment. Watch the connection here. He says, uh, 7 verse 5, he says, For when we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side without our fightings. What does he say next there? Within were fears. 
Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that what? You know who God comforts? God comforts people like me and you. Those that are cast down. They that are whole need not a physician. But they that are sick. How many of you go to the doctor when you're not sick? Everything's great. You feel wonderful. You can run a marathon. Two of them, in fact, one day apart. How many of you go to the doctor then? You should go to get your head examined. Right? Anyway, <laughs> you know. No, no. It's when, when you're not feeling so good. And even then, your wife's got to kick you. And, Honey, go. I need you around to pay the bills. <laughs> right? Many of you, if not all of you here today, but what I have found over the years more and more is that everybody's got something going on, some kind of infirmity, some kind of health issue, ache, pain. We all have stories. I have been able to relate to some of those more the last several years. A lot of you guys know. <laughs> and it's interesting how it does change your thinking about first these verses. Because they become, there's a new depth to the verses. You knew them intellectually. You knew them theoretically. But all of a sudden, with that situation that happens, you had to put your toe further into the water. You had to jump in to my grace is sufficient. Check and see if you can swim around in my grace is sufficient. Will it hold you up or are you going to drown? And in experiencing those things, you have found, I have found, we have found, that we're more equipped to minister one to another. Not so much to, as, in fact, I think Sue told me this joke one day. She said that she was talking about a dear saint that comes to the church and does her organ recital every Sunday. She talks about her liver and her kidney and her thyroid and her gallbladder, you know, all the organs that are going bad, you know. <laughs> right? Listen, the more that, you and I personally experiencing, experience the perishing of the outer man. We have the opportunity to partake of the afflictions of the gospel, but to do so according to the ability of the word of God to sustain us. We learn that this is an earthen vessel. I've got to quit trusting in myself. I want to learn to depend upon the word of God to be my resource, my stay, my comfort, my encouragement, the place of rest. And when we do that, you know what's actually happening? At verse 10, he says, always bearing about in the body of the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might... Wait a minute. You mean as I experience the perishing of the outer man, that just peels away, in a sense, this earthen vessel... And as it's peeled away, the treasure is being made manifest. Christ is being manifest. And the word Paul uses in Philippians is magnified. Manifest is put on display for others to see. Magnified is to be made large so they see the details of how the verses work. Quickly, 2 Corinthians 12. For this thing, I besought the Lord thrice, verse 8, that it might depart from me. Paul's thinking there is, I, I should say our thinking parallels Paul's many, many times in that you can see Paul is kind of thinking, Lord, if, if you'll just take this affliction away, it, it's, really, it, it's really buffeting me. It's hindering me. It's in my way. I, I, I can't think clearly. It's, it's hindering the work. And Lord, if you'll just come and take this thing away, then I'll really be able to get on with the ministry. Don't we think that way sometimes? Lord, if only, then. If you would just, then I would. Don't we do that? It's like making bargains or deals with God or whatever. How's that working, by the way? Doesn't work. <laughs> you know? He says, Lord, for this, he says, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice, it might depart from me, depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. 
For my strength is made perfect in weakness. So see, once again, Paul, it's either going to be my strength or your strength. You're going to trust one or the other, but in order to trust my strength, You'll have to be okay with you being weak. Because it's in the recognition of your own weakness, your own inability, your own lack of resource, that you'll value more and more and more the resource of Christ crucified, of Christ our life, of the Word of God. Afflictions have a way of accelerating the learning process. Right? When the teacher threatened to smack you on the knuckles with the, with the, with the ruler, you kind of sat up quickly. <laughs> well, God's not going to smack you on the knuckles with the ruler of his word, but he's going to say, you know, when affliction comes, the afflictions of the gospel come, the infirmities when they come. You know what? I'm ready. God said, my word's right there. The treasure's in you. Christ is in you. It's right there. It's a thought away. It's just, where are you going to place your confidence? He says, my grace is sufficient for thee. All that I've done for you in Christ is sufficient. Christ crucified is sufficient. Who I've made you in Christ, you're complete, you're accepted, you're in the beloved. It's sufficient, Paul. What would be a reasonable question to ask about that? Wouldn't it be something like, well, Lord, how, it, Lord, teach me how, because I don't know. Which, which should drive us to the word, right? He says, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. And as Brother Jordan said the other night, and I will agree with him heartily, I'm not there yet quite. <laughs> oh, theoretically, sure. All the preachers, we all will quote that verse. But if we say, if the Lord says, hey, John, I got something I want to teach you. He, he doesn't say it that way. But if he said, you know, but, but in order to teach you about this affliction and suffering stuff, I, I got I to flip a coin here. I'm, I'm going to either send affliction on you or on Ted. I'm going to say, Ted, Ted, go ahead. Look, he's a good guy. Man, good preacher. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> go with it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. What's that? Yeah, he says, wait a minute. <laughs> but don't we do that? Yeah, does he get a vote, you know? You see, we, in our inner man, we say, all right, Lord, listen, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying the Lord is saying, I'm going to afflict you. I'm not saying that. Did that confuse anybody about that? I probably did. So let me clarify that. I'm not saying the Lord, that works. that's not, not what he's doing. When affliction comes, it's not the Lord doing it. We live in the present evil world. Satan's a god of this world. We all make bad choices sometimes. When those situations come, we, we can either argue about the Lord or argue with the Lord, or we can say, okay, Lord, I know you didn't do this. I know you're not chasing him for, for some sin. I know you're not going to be not kicking me out. Lord, this is the opportunity to learn to trust you. Take you at your word. And the Lord said, yeah. And, and it's like the Lord said, do you want to talk to me about that? And say, well, okay. Or I say, no, Lord, I'm mad at you. <laughs> you ever get mad at the Lord? <laughs> just, just talk to him, you know. But affliction is the opportunity to be a partaker of the ability of the word of God to sustain. He says, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am, what? Then am I? Str and you've heard me talk about that verse over the years, haven't you? You've heard me. There's so many reasons why to make your King James Bible to believe it's the Word of God, infallible and errant. Listen, that's one of them right there. That's gigantic. When that verse says, for when I am weak, that's me. Then am I strong? That's me sitting back and resting in His grace. You see how he, you see how he changed those? It's going to be either I am or am I. See the difference there? Yet not I, but Christ. What are we trying to say? We're trying to convey the fact 
that the Scripture declares that the Word of God, rightly divided, is the power of God. And when Paul encourages Timothy to be a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel, but do so according to the power of God, the power of God is the Word of God. The ability of the Word of God to sustain, to encourage, to edify, to to comfort. But look at two verses, if you would. We're, We're almost done here. That's a relative term, isn't it? The word almost. How do you define that, right? <laughs> Look over to Romans 15 and, and 1 Thessalonians 2. You want to have Romans 15 and 1 Thessalonians 2. Look at these two verses here. We're going to look at the one in 1 Thessalonians 2.13. He says this. He says, for this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you, when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as, that, but as it is in truth. Okay, what? What is it? Okay, so think about that. If it's the word of God, then what must be true about it? Someone said it. It works. It'll effectually work. And so he goes on to say, the word of God, which says what? Effectually worketh also where? In you that believe. How many of you here tonight are saved? I'm talking about eternally justified, forgiven, saved, so blessed, loved. Okay. How, how did that happen? Say it really that, would you? Who said that? It happened when you took the God of heaven and earth, the God who spoke to creation and existence out of absolutely nothing, and you took him at his word. You haven't seen him with your eyeballs. You have not heard him with your ears. You read it in a, a book, the Bible, words black and white. And you made a decision about the eternal destiny of your soul. That what I'm going to do, I'm going to choose to play. I'm going to wager my soul. When I step through that door, that portal called death into whatever the next life is, I'm wagering the outcome of my soul on the validity, the, 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 the truth of this book right here, the Word of God. And when you chose to believe what you heard. You read the book, someone preached to you, or you read it, and you believed it as it was, and what it claimed to be, the Word of God, you believed it. Guess what happened? God did what He said He would do. Imagine that. Someone actually does tell the truth. Someone is trustworthy. He cannot lie. And He promised before the world began to give eternal life to anyone who would just believe. And you took him at his word. And he saved you. You belong to him forever now. No matter what the world says, no matter what the flesh says, no matter the fears, the anxiety, the tears, the frailty that you feel, the hurt, the pain, God will not let his word down, so he cannot let you down. Romans 15 Romans 15, he says this. Romans 15, verse 13. 15, 13 says this. Now the God of what? Listen, the God who makes a promise, he cannot lie, so you know that promise is going to come to pass, so the God who is able to keep his word and will do it. Now the God of hope, fill you with all what and what? what? Boy, can't some of us use that? We're filled with a lot of other stuff. (laughs) You know, troubles, anxiety, heartaches, emotions, pain, difficulties, the challenges of just life. That's all real. God says, I'll come along and there's a supernatural filling that I will give you. It'll be joy and peace. Boy, can we use some of that in this world? Joy and peace in doing what? In believing 
that you may abound in what? Through the power of who? The Holy Ghost. Well, we should have a Holy Ghost meeting here, right? (laughs) The power of the Holy Ghost. I want to close the message this evening by an illustration. Go back with me, if you would, over to Jeremiah, chapter number 2. I want to try to use a quick illustration here and then just summarize. Jeremiah, chapter number 2. And I'm going to write up on the board here. Hopefully, you all can see this. All right. Can you all see that? Look at this verse in Jeremiah here. He says at verse 11, 211, Jeremiah says this, Hath a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods, but my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. If it does not profit, you know what it is? It's weak and it's beggarly. It cannot accomplish what you think it's going to accomplish, right? And then he says this, he, the, the way he says, he says, be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid, be very desolate. So it's like he calls to the heavens out there, the, angel, the, the angels, by, by the way, both the good and the bad ones. He, he says, guys, be astonished at this. Look at what my people have done. He says, Verse 13, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. He says, just be astonished at this. Look what my people did. I gave them my word. I demonstrated my power. I rescued them out of Egypt. I redeemed them. I made them my own. I, got, I entered into a covenant with them. I, the living God, the living God, the living water, the living word. And you know what they did? They had the resource of me, my word, my life, he's saying. And they forsook that for the weak and beggarly. They fashioned cisterns. What's a cistern? It's a vessel of clay. And it's broken. Even the water you put in just going to fall right out. See the issue there? The Apostle Paul says to Timothy, he says, Timothy, I can relate to the afflictions you're experiencing because I suffered them as well. But I know whom I have believed. And Timothy, you believe the same God I believed. You believe the same message I believed. And he is able... So, Timothy, do this. Get back in the fight. It's a fight of faith, and it's a good fight. It's a fight worth engaging. But do so according to the power of God, according to the ability of the living God, who is the living water, who gave us the living word to be our resource, our life. Lord, may it be so for us. Our gracious God and Father, we pray that as we have thought about these things this evening and as we've spent the time this weekend just looking at verses that we've all looked at so many times, 
and we'll look at many, many times more. God, help us, even if it's just a little bit more each day, to see and experience and enjoy the reality of you as the living God, you as the living word, your word as the resource from which we draw upon life. And we'll thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen.